In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. Hello and welcome to Low Impact TV. I'm Tom Woodruff for Mutual Credit Services and today I'm talking with Thomas Fleischmann of Informal Systems. Welcome Tom, great to have you here. Oh, uh, hi Tom, thanks for inviting me for this. So Low Impact has been doing a whole series of articles on credit clearing and I'm really excited to talk to you about your deep expertise in economic networks and liquidity saving mechanisms. We've been working together on the Local Loop Northwest Clearing Club for over a year now. The engine line that project, which is multilateral obligation set off, is something you've got decades of experience with. Can you tell me how you got into that work? Yeah, it's a, it's a coincidence more or less. So uh, I was doing my, my job as a management consultant and uh, my coworkers uh, were uh, actually the inventors of uh, the system that is used in Slovenia now since 91. So this would be 32 years now. And uh, we were discussing these uh, topics a lot over coffee for years. So why does it work? Why does it, doesn't it work? Uh, what kind of implication does it have for, for local economy? What could be the macro potential of this? So mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of coffee talks. And uh, from these coffee talks, uh, it turned into um, a little bit of a uh, Think so. Let's explore it. What does it mean? Um, why is it only successful in Slovenia? Why is is not uh, employed everywhere? Uh, how does it relate uh, to to the macro and microeconomic questions? So I started uh, studying this stuff, and um, after a certain time, uh, it, it turned out that. It, it might be an, a, a new career choice, let's say. Right, right. And uh, I, I went out uh, seeking for for like-minded people. Mm. And uh, it turns out that uh, the people who understand this kind of concepts, most are those who are involved in complementary currencies. I was seeking for good examples. Uh, what are the, the, the best, the biggest, the most successful? And in, in this search, uh, I found uh, uh, Giuseppe Littera, uh, founder of mm -hmm. Sardex Network, and then Paolo Dini. And uh, we studied uh, uh, this system even a little bit more, uh, tried to combine it with the concept of mutual credit. We wrote uh, mm -hmm. an article, and uh, it was much more successful than anticipated, let's say. And basically, uh, uh, kickstart my, my career in this area of alternative uh, finance. Okay, I'd like to come back to that article, article later on, because it was a bit of a revelation for us at Mutual Credit Services. Um, but from what you're saying, it sounds like by the time you came across this idea of multilateral obligation set off, it had already been used in Slovenia at the national scale for some time. Could you tell me a bit about the history of that? Um, was there anything special about Slovenia? which enabled yeah. it to happen there? Yeah, in Slovenia, uh, I, so it started in 1991. So those who know a bit of the history uh, would know that uh, this is the year when Slovenia broke uh, from the, what used to be Yugoslavia. And uh, the system was actually used in, in less efficient form even previously in mm -hmm. in uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, so there was one specific in Yugoslavia that uh, the, the payment system was accessible not just by banks like it is used in, in the West, but basically everyone could access it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the use of liquidity saving features, which is now uh, more or less standard in, in latest and greatest payment systems around, uh, this was something that uh, people were basically used to, mm. but uh, uh, it, it is a, 
in terms of information processing, this liquidity saving uh, are, are hard uh, uh, not to crack. And uh, the computer systems at that time were, were not at the level they are now. Mm. Uh, so the systems use were not so efficient. So what, what is interesting with the system that started in 91 in Slovenia is that it is mathematically most efficient system possible. So you, mm. you, you cannot save more liquidity than uh, by any uh, by any method. So this is this is something that 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 maybe sets this system apart. And mm. then it is also this uh, the the timing when when it started. So people who don't who didn't experience uh, for them it's hard to imagine but uh, we, we were a new nation uh, not recognized by the world community the the normal banking routes uh, were not completely broken but uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say that there was a restricted access to um, we we didn't have a national uh, currency we used coupons uh, mm -hmm. that were printed on a leftover paper from from coupons that were printed for Olympic Games in Sarajevo. Wow. Uh, there was uh, no name on these coupons, no date, no signature of, uh, of uh, the central bank governor, mm -hmm. which is kind of a standard for... for... So we, we used these coupons for one year. So mm -hmm. the, the situation in terms of uh, money, how money is generated, uh, the availability of liquidity, so it, it was a tough, it was mm -hmm. a tough time. And, and in this situation, the alternative uh, uh, ways to, to settle were more than welcome. So in the first year of the operation, this uh, system uh, saved approximately 7.5% of GDP, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I think, uh, I, I have never heard of an alternative financial instrument that would, uh, uh, that would have such a huge uh, impact on the national mm -hmm. economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd like to come to the um, vouchers, which, which are issued, because I haven't heard about those before. But just to continue with the multilateral set off, so you said that 1991 was the first time that a very optimized system had been implemented. Uh, but of course, as we know from talking to Hans Florian and others, these systems actually go back centuries in one form or another. What's really interesting to me is that in Slovenia, this is, it was at least the first instance Dylan myself at MCS had heard of this system being used at large scale in the real economy. We'd heard that banks and financial institutions had used these liquidity saving mechanisms. But the idea that there was a whole country uh where this was pretty routine was was kind of mind-blowing for us um so how did what what were the steps which enabled this to be used in the real economy um up to 1991 mm, i don't know this is this was basically a standard procedure so i'm, I'm mm. too young to, to know <laughs> all the details so i, I have to uh, i can only uh, relay the the experiences that that were uh, explained to me by my, my colleagues so mm. um, to, to say it uh, very simply so the the financial discipline in in uh, a relatively large federation as Yugoslavia was not so good and it turned out that uh, multilateral set off was a way to uh, to ease the pressures between the the members of the federation so it mm -hmm. enabled a lot of uh, transactions that that would otherwise not happen so in mm -hmm. in this sense this uh, uh, mechanism was very crucial but the the use of this was very basic so uh, the the confirmation of debts were 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 written on pieces of paper and mm -hmm. th this was then taken to to the uh, to the central accounting offices so this is how uh, approximately how the agency was called mm -hmm. and uh, basically they were treated with accounting methods not 
banking payment methods mm. because mm. this multilateral set of is basically it's done on on the accounting level mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, this is how it uh, started uh, but uh, you as you said it and uh, okay i also know florian so this is uh, these systems are basically old although mm -hmm. the the way they were used uh, in, in, uh, in the past were a little bit different so mm -hmm. the the historic concentration has certain details that are that are slightly different than multilateral mm -hmm. set, obligation set off. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, the difference is not so big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, we one of the reasons we got really excited about this at MCS was that um, it's relatively simple. It's far lower risk than, say, mutual credit, and that therefore you can bring large numbers of businesses into these collaborative financial relationships relatively quickly um, and without them taking on too much risk. And so that was one of the reasons we got really excited about it. Perhaps you could say a bit about its usage since 1991. Have more people been using it? Fewer people been using it? Yeah, the, the usage after 1991 is steadily declining with peaks at financial crisis. So mm. basically, one of the problems with, uh, with the multilateral set of is that uh, on the individual level and in terms of financial gains or let's say immediate financial gains, mm. uh, it doesn't bring a lot of value to individual players. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can say, okay, the, the average saving for individual player in, in Slovenia is somewhere in the region of uh, 10%, let's say. Mm -hmm. it, it mm -hmm. depends from year to year. It, it goes like from seven to 12 percent something like that but this is average that means that some some participants have a huge uh, financial benefits from this but most most have less than average mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, this goes uh, towards the centrality of uh, of players so that's something you can see uh, here from the uh, network behind me you can see that in a real life economy uh, because this network behind me is a, a snapshot of a real life economy it has large hubs and uh, mm -hmm. centrally positioned hubs benefit from these systems more than than mm -hmm. uh, the individual players on on the edges so but what is important uh, and the very important benefit of this is a systemic benefit mm -hmm. basically you you uh, you reduce the systemic risk in the system as a whole and uh, this creates a more more stable uh, financial environment and it mm -hmm. creates uh, new opportunities for for all so it creates new opportunities for um, for firms because of the increased uh, payment discipline it is easier to uh, to start a new business, to, to mm, finance mm. new business. For, for the banks, it is easier to provide finance because uh, there is a this de-risking mechanism. Basically, the, the, the obligation set of multilateral obligation set of uh, acts as a as a risk reducing measure. So and, mm -hmm. and this is this is from the from the immediate economic impact i think the most important uh, uh, influence of these uh, systems but <clears throat> what it turned out in, in, in slovenia because the the system is a state uh, agency run mm -hmm. but the participation for the practical purposes is voluntary Mm -hmm. So not everyone participates, but those who who participate re regularly participate because this system has a long term benefits yeah. in, in the sense of improved relationships between uh, the the uh, the participants of uh, multilateral mm -hmm. obligation set off. So uh, w w if you ask a regular user how does it feel uh, you would hear something like okay um, 
I have a shorter base payable. I have shorter mm -hmm. base uh, yeah, uh, receivable. Uh, this makes a better uh, relationship with both my, my customers and my suppliers. And because of this better relationship, we are often, uh, uh, so users often receive uh, special treatment or better treatment from, from their uh, suppliers and, mm -hmm. and customers mm -hmm. uh, in terms of getting uh, better conditions, uh, maybe little favors. Sometimes people need something to move quick or, or things like that. So the, the relationship part that, that is built mm. using this system is, is actually providing the, the biggest benefit, but this does not come with the first uh, obligation set of so this, right. this benefit comes after you are part of the system and you are using mm. Mm. so actually it's it might make sense for certain people to use um but there's a bit of a not necessarily a barrier to entry but maybe it's you there's not an incredibly compelling reason why as an individual business you would definitely want to always use this um and actually does that does that mean that sometimes it's easier to have conversations about the benefits of this mechanism with more systemic players like governments for example do they do they seem to think this is a really really good thing but they can't quite persuade ordinary businesses to get involved yeah this yeah how, how to kickstart this and this is mm. a question <laughs> of a big concern to me so um what is interesting is that uh, financial industry in general is not very interested about this because on the first glance they see this as a as something that would uh, eat into their uh, normal mm. business i i disagree with this uh, thesis i think they are uh, wrong that the, the truth is different but at, at this point the financial industry is still not uh, really pressured to do any any mm. changes mm. but what is interesting that nation states and and central banks are interested in in this mm -hmm. because they see this as a as a risk reduction measure and as a way to uh, as a way to intervene on the market in times of crisis and mm -hmm. uh, as a, so it is an inter interesting uh, instrument that would complement the existing uh, tools that the central banks have at their hands uh, to make market interventions so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What they use currently, like uh, setting up interest rates, doing quantitative easing, and, uh, uh, and and stuff like this, uh, it is basically very limited, and these mm -hmm. tools are not very precise. Yep. So doing um, doing a multilateral uh, obligation set of risks can be a very precise tool, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, it's hard uh, hard to implement. I think. Uh, this is this is uh, this is a very problematic point mm. of view in terms uh, of, of implementation. But uh, if you go on a smaller scale, like local communities, then uh, the, the problem the problem there is that uh, the, the whole development of economies, so the the strength of uh, globalization of long uh, supply chains where mm -hmm. where most of your partners are far away, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, uh, this development doesn't uh, doesn't enable easy implementation of of local mm -hmm. uh, uh, local multilateral obligation set of uh, projects, mm -hmm. but there 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 are remedies and uh, i think the biggest uh, opportunity here is to involve uh, local lo locally important uh, projects so right mm -hmm. now that there is because of the crisis and uh, uh, because we see that uh, that long chains and dependence on on uh, being part of a global supply chain uh, holds a lot of risks that can hurt quite badly. The, the, the general trend of uh, seeking for a local resilience in terms of uh, energy safety, food safety. Mm -hmm. And then there are also 
more normal things like uh, social uh, social causes uh, maybe local employment opportunities so mm -hmm. there are many 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 local projects that uh, that have problems finding financing because mm -hmm. in in the established uh, financial world these projects are simply not profitable and yeah. because they are not profitable uh, it is hard to get um, uh, commercial financing in the banks mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. reliant on a government uh, subsidies uh, is also a, a strange option so it's a very centralized ad administratively complicated process mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to get this kind of uh, financing so combining uh, local local uh, business uh, circles with uh, local initiatives Mm -hmm. that actually create local circulation of uh, value mm -hmm. and uh, empowering these local circles with mm -hmm. mechanisms like multilateral obligation set off i think this is this is the direction to go yeah i agree that's certainly the direction mutual credit services is working towards um and of course we've got the local loop northwest project which we can go into in more detail in a minute um I'd like to talk to you about other collaborative finance tools as well as multilateral set off. But before we do that, I'd like to just um, ask whether there have been any attempts to replicate uh, something like the Slovenian system at the national scale, or have you just, just been, has it just been too difficult to get governments and central banks willing to do the necessary work? On the national scale, as far uh, as I know, Slovenia is most successful, but it's not the only mm. one. So we have uh, uh, we have something very similar. They use different uh, algorithms, different uh, techniques uh, in Romania. There is a quasi-national scale. It would be a part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mm -hmm. This is Republika Srpska. In, uh, so this is the project in Banja Luka. Mm -hmm. Uh, otherwise, uh, I I don't know of other national size projects. But then you have a lot of uh, local uh, projects, like um, uh, uh, there are projects in Italy, uh, mm -hmm. relatively old projects, uh, working projects in Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also uh, 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 an interesting project running in Netherlands. And uh, yeah, going back to national scale, for example, Portugal established uh, uh, legislation uh, in 2019. And uh, their idea was not to run this uh, as a government agency, but to seek a private public partnership. Mm -hmm. So uh, by the Portuguese legislation, you can get white listed and and start this kind of service, but it it is so difficult to kickstart on mm. the national level mm. that till now they were unable to find a private partner for this uh, yeah. initiative. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so there's plenty of recognition that this could be a useful tool. The problem comes down to implementation, and it sounds like there are all sorts of local projects of a greater or lesser size which are trying to crack that problem um what what are the requirements for setting up a local a successful local multilateral set-off scheme yeah so uh, the, the the crucial element for success of multilateral obligation set-off is the existing existence of cycles within the the network that is created by by the system participants and this uh, this cycles this is uh, it's an interesting story so intuitively you would say okay the, the, the more you have the more cycles there will be but uh, mm. unfortunately uh, these systems are chaotic systems so there is there is a little bit of theory of chaos behind it so mm -hmm. th those who are fluent in mathematics would understand but for this interview let's just say that that appearance of cycles uh, in, in network is like a phase transition. 
So you grow your network and there are no cycles and there are, and you grow it more and there are no cycles. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, at a certain moment, not that one cycle appears, but there are everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. It's basically like, like a switch. So there are no, and then at a certain point, they are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And reaching this, uh, this point, uh, uh, I think is is the challenge uh, for for any uh, grassroots project. So getting mm -hmm. getting enough. And <clears throat> it, it, interestingly, it's not about the number of participants. Mm. It is about the the density of the network. Mm -hmm. So what you are looking for is to to have somewhere between two and three, better above three uh, obligations between network members so, so it has to be between mm -hmm. network uh, members uh, with this with this goal uh, you will probably hit hit the the phase transi transition point relatively soon so you don't need mm -hmm. like thousands of participants but but having like 50 100 200 some, somewhere there uh, the, the the phase transition should happen. Mm -hmm. So you've said these economic networks are chaotic, um, and you can clearly see in the diagram behind you, there's a lot of structure there. You can see there are some nodes which are basically super connectors, and then others which are not so central. Yeah. Could you say a bit about, uh, just a bit more about the dynamics of these economic networks, and also over all of your experience working with them, what's really surprised you or continues to surprise yeah. you? Yeah, okay, so uh, these uh, networks are chaotic. The order that you see in the figure behind me uh, is uh, a bit deceiving, let's say. So m most people uh, see this as a as random networks where, mm. uh, where firms are somehow connected uh, between each other uh, randomly. But actually what happens is that there, is a, there, is, there are rules uh, for, for the connections within this network. Mm. And uh, the most important rule here is a preferential attachment rule. Mm -hmm. And this rule is, 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 um, is very simple. It says that a new participant in the network is more likely to connect uh, to uh, existing big player in mm -hmm. the network than, than to uh, someone who is not. So I, I, I simplify this a little bit, mm -hmm. but this is the, the the closest to understand how this works and uh, the result of this is that you get you get uh, uh, highly connected network uh, that is uh, clustered so mm -hmm. you have you have these hubs that that you see uh, but the uh, what, what is interesting within this that this all these clusters are connected among among each other mm -hmm. and this then creates something that we know as a small world uh, effect basically mm -hmm. you you get a super connected uh, uh, network where every participant is connected with every other participant and the average path between two is uh, relatively short so mm -hmm. uh, in the network behind me the average path between any two dots is uh, around uh, 4.5 steps so you can get from one side of the network to the other in only four yes. and a half steps this yes. is like the six degrees of separation idea uh, yes this is basically this uh, this idea uh, six degrees of separation is actually the the direct result of preferential attachment mm -hmm. rule. And if you study uh, Barabasi and his uh, scale-free networks, uh, you will find, so depending on the, on the exact uh, parameters uh, of, of the scale-free network, you can calculate the shortest, the average shortest part, uh, part and mm -hmm. it, it is very short always. <laughs> yeah. So, Six degrees is like you, you, you take a network of million participants on and more. And so uh, the, the actual formula is uh, the, the, uh, the, there are three different uh, 
there are three different cases, but uh, the, the most use, use case is uh, the case where the, the average length of the path between participants is logarithm of logarithm of number of participants. So mm -hmm. for mathematicians, if, if you have double logarithm, you know that it, it doesn't get a big number. You, you put uh, millions, but you still get like six. Yeah. Right. It plateaus pretty quickly and then just stops growing. You can keep yeah. adding more and more people, but you find you can always find your way to them. They're always connected. Yes. So that's, if I understand correctly, one of the other consequences of this particular network structure or just preferential attachment, it's kind of the rich get richer. And so there's a sense that there's an inequality of some people are very, very strongly connected. Um, some people are much more at the fringes. Is Does multilateral obligation set off? What What are the effects when you run the algorithm on that kind of network structure? Do you tend to see highly yeah. unequal outcomes? Do the people, do the richest firms benefit the most or do the smallest firms benefit the most? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is interesting with multilateral obligation set off is that uh, if you <clears> seek uh, for for a result there are infinite possible <clears> results uh, you can separate this uh, huge number of potential outcomes into two groups one would be uh, what i call viable solutions that means yes it is a, a, a set off yes the remaining network is acyclic so you don't have yeah. any new cycle, but you didn't reach the, the maximum uh, set of amount possible. Mm -hmm. And then there are maximum weight set offs. And even here, it's not just one. So you, <laughs> you have the multitude. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that the, the, the network science and uh, the, the graph flow algorithms uh, that are used to, to support this idea of multilateral observation set off do not uh, uh, do not support uh, the idea of uh, governance of, of this result. So, mm -hmm. how, uh, so how can I choose a result that benefits the most uh, 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 the most network participants mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. still reaches the maximum. So this would be a question. And this is one of the things uh, that I'm currently uh, actively working on. So there are mm -hmm. some uh, interesting routes for this solution. But uh, then uh, we, we uh, one of the concerns is to, to make this to make this uh, something that is acceptable for uh, for for the people, for the financial industry. So currently, what is done in Slovenia is that uh, we use a principle of lottery. Basically, the mm -hmm. the result. So the the, con the initial conditions uh, before the algorithm starts are uh, randomized, mm -hmm. so that uh, no one has influence on on the actually chosen maximum solution. But I think, uh, especially for smaller communities, this is not a good solution. So mm, mm. We, are, we are working very hard at Informal now to, uh, to provide a solution that would also include some kind of governance mm -hmm. possibilities where, where communities could set their priorities. Mm -hmm. But this, this has to be done uh, very transparently transparently otherwise yeah. uh, it could be a tool to manipulate so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we, we are taking and, and, and me personally so i and we are taking huge care to make this properly and mm -hmm. to make it in a way that benefits uh, the communities using it yeah and and so very roughly what would be the options for a community which was running the system for themselves very very broadly speaking what choices could they make? Yeah, they could make choices like uh, mm -hmm. what is more important for, for the community. Okay, if if, uh, if food safety is the most important issue, then, uh, for example, this could be set up that everyone who is involved, actively involved in the food safety would 
benefit more from this than others. So this could mm-hmm. be mm-hmm. this could be a concrete example how how this could be governed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really exciting, and the the alignment between the approach being taken at informal systems and MCS is obviously very encouraging because, as you know, we're really wanting to set these networks up uh, really just as clubs with them being run by and for their members on a commons governance basis. And so having people like yourself working very hard on the technical requirements to underpin that decision making is just it's it's invaluable, really, and really excited to see what that looks like in practice. Um, As you know, we're at a point where we're trialing the system in Lancaster, but MCS's model really is to franchise um, the platforms we create. We really like the idea of there being lots and lots of small, relatively small, self-governing groups making decisions about what they prioritize within their communities. But of course, then you have this, um, there's an interesting trade-off between being small enough for commons governance, but being large enough to have a network which is economically viable. Um, yeah, so size, size is not everything. So uh, I think for for small communities, there are there are huge opportunities to to be creative in, in mm. how they use multilateral obligation set up. So one of the 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 key problems here is uh, liquidity. So in in the basic form, the multilateral obligation set of provides liquidity savings, but mm-hmm. with a little bit of creativity, let's say, so not doing anything illegal, let's say, uh, you, you can actually provide liquidity to the community by using mm-hmm. multilateral uh, obligation set of. So, uh, uh, what you actually need is you need to create opportunities for uh, for local cycles uh, creation and I, okay we already mentioned this in, in this interview yeah. and uh, uh, what you can actually do is is say like say it like this uh, okay we have a we have a local initiative uh, the group is actively per- uh, is actively trying to help uh, financially to, uh, mm-hmm. to, for this initiative to succeed. For example, it is let's say that it is about the food safety, you know? and uh, so everyone participates with a small amount, like mm-hmm. ten pounds, hundred pounds. So n- not not uh, a large amount. And then this initiative, uh, they they purchase everything locally. And uh, mm-hmm. preferentially within within the the uh, multilateral uh, obligation set of members group. And what happens is that all the the funding, all the goodwill to to financially support this project mm-hmm. gets multiplied within the with the cycles uh, within the network so if you know that the average length of uh, of the uh, path between two uh, between two members of, of such a network would be in a small network it would be around three or four so this mm-hmm. is a rea- reality for uh, for uh, small communities like lancaster then one uh, uh, one leg of this trip would be from a donor to this uh, food safety initiative, but mm-hmm. then it has to make three steps back. Mm-hmm. And this is this is actually a, a, a multiplier effect, and in in all uh, the the effect is basically you are you are doing a good uh, good deed, mm-hmm. but with this good deed you are also creating local uh, local liquidity and mm-hmm. you are offsetting more debt than you donate it. So you donate mm-hmm. it 10 and in the same time you created conditions to, to offset 40 uh, pounds of, of debt, so four times mm-hmm. more debt. So and this is, I think this is an, an attractive option for local communities 
mm-hmm. to engage in creating uh, in creating local 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 cycles based on on projects that are important for the community not mm-hmm. so you, you, you cannot do this with commercial projects or, or right. with, with market driven initiatives but you can do this with local community uh, mm-hmm. projects so that that's really interesting because it makes it really clear that these networks don't run themselves they are very very social in character and you need a, a kind of activist mindset so that implies that somebody could make a living perhaps being in their community creating opportunities creating the conditions for this kind of system to really support the priorities of their community and i find that really exciting it's not being run remotely in a very technocratic manner by um, experts or the central government it's really something which can create opportunities locally for people to more consciously decide the priorities for their locality uh, yeah, I, I agree fully. And uh, large enough network uh, can be fully uh, self-sufficient. So from the experience, uh, having uh, one promil uh, as a service fee for this kind of stuff mm. uh, is more than sufficient to run a national size project. Mm. So this is mm. the case in Slovenia. In Lancaster, maybe one promil uh, would not provide enough to cover the fixed cost of running the system, but mm-hmm. still you don't need like 10% or so you, right. you, need, a, you need a relatively small uh, <clears throat> service fee for, um, for every obligation that is uh, offset. Mm-hmm. And this makes, uh, uh, this makes uh, such local ins- initiative self sufficient yeah. but the the key the key uh, task of this community is uh, making sure that the, the system is uh, uh, constantly running and that mm-hmm. there is a constant uh, supply of new initiatives what mm-hmm. what social benefits is this uh, local circle actually uh, uh, providing by but by, by providing at least part of financing for for local projects. So yeah. I think this is very important that uh, that when, when thinking about uh, multilateral obligation set up, that you don't think it as uh, the only financial. Mm-hmm. So this mm-hmm. is always uh, a complementary uh, yeah. uh, option, <clears throat> but it can be a, a large part. So. I think for a for a local uh, initiative, if you make it a central point, like mm-hmm. here, it, it can provide like 20, 30, 40 percent of, of funding. So mm-hmm. this this I see this as a realistic uh, scenario, and mm-hmm. this is important. So because uh, if you look like okay, if uh, if a local council has to provide uh, pounds, uh, mm-hmm. the real pounds from the banking system. So, and the local community provides uh, additional 40%, so it's mm-hmm. 65. So it, it is a huge uh, increase in, in, in the use of, of funding. So I think this is also interesting for local councils, councils mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that they see that the, the initiatives uh, they finance get additional financing by by uh, circulation in the community Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you mentioned about 10 minutes ago this idea of um, introducing liquidity into the network and multilateral obligation set off is only one of the tools the collaborative finance team at informal systems is working on so perhaps we could move on to talk a bit about the other things you're up to yeah the the other things uh, are, are basically creating local local monetary instruments uh, like uh, vouchers, mutual credit. So I'm not uh, the, the top expert at the formal systems for this stuff. So my colleagues, especially uh, Giuseppe Litter and Paul Dini, they, they, Giuseppe is the founder of, uh, of a Sardex. Sardex mm-hmm. is, I think, the second largest uh, complementary currency uh, around. So only Vier Frank in, in Switzerland is mm-hmm. bigger. Uh, so they have more more experience uh, in this stuff. But uh, 
what what we we are driving to is to marry the multilateral obligation set of with what we call liquidity sources mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and liquidity source can can be uh, a lot of things so the the simplest liquidity source would be a trust line between me and you so i trust you that you will return me a hundred pounds in three months mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if i if we enter this trust line in the obligation network as a liquidity source it will do its magic by the merit of this multiplier uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. effect and this would be let's say the, the most simple and the, the, the basic uh, way to introduce liquidity in, in the system mm -hmm. where the the risk of providing liquidity which is basically risk management is is actually the, the what makes liquidity provision costly so you mm -hmm. you pay for the risk management but here in this case in the case of a trust line the risk is uh, totally contained between the the pair of uh, of um, uh, network members that decide to do this so mm -hmm. this risk cannot spread mm -hmm. Uh, in uh, in the difference between this concept and the banks, for example, is that this risk cannot be socialized. So, yeah, what we see in in banking is uh, privatization of profits and socialization of uh, of uh, loss, losses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So risks are basically socialized, and in, in the case that I described, you don't have a, a socialization of uh, of risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you are a little bit more brave, if there is a group of uh, of uh, firms uh, that uh, work really closely together and they decide uh, that they want to provide liquidity to the system by trusting each other, so making a mutual credit club, it mm -hmm. can be a very small club, three, five, ten, twenty members, doesn't matter. So it, you don't need like thousands of members to, to to provide liquidity, uh, they they can do the same thing as a pair, and mm -hmm. the risk in this case actually is socialized, but it is still contained uh, uh, within this small group, so it cannot run out. And they've all agreed to be there. And they all agreed, and they they so I think when this kind of clubs are uh, established. So that the, the local network that supports local causes uh, functions better. Mm -hmm. So this would this would these are I think kind of incentives uh, uh, to to do this stuff. Uh, then of course we could introduce and and we will introduce other liquidity sources, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. including fiat and crypto, which might might mm -hmm. be more more interesting stuff so uh, what is interesting with um, with multilateral uh, obligation set of when you apply uh, different uh, but disjoint uh, liquidity sources mm. uh, the liquidity sources don't mix so right you cannot have like because we have crypto uh, it ruins the multi uh, the mutual credit or something mm -hmm. like that so mm -hmm. basically there is no there is no uh, risk transfer between liquidity sources mm -hmm. uh, in, in the truth is that it is even better so the participation on the system uh, acts as a risk re reduction mechanism for all participating mechanisms also for mm -hmm. uh, participating liquidity providers yeah so let's talk a bit about the consequences of doing of had, having liquidity sources within one of these networks because you said earlier that in Slovenia for the typical firm they might clear maybe 10 15 20 percent of their obligations what happens to that number if you introduce a means of payment like mutual credit or like crypto yeah okay so it depends uh, on uh, how much and how it is distributed so mm -hmm. Uh, this uh, obligation networks have two very 
uh, interesting uh, and easy measurable properties. So one is uh, one is I call a B vector. This would be um, net positions with vector. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for each uh, participating member to, to recognize uh, what is his net position in the network. So basically, this would be all your credits minus all your debits. So mm -hmm. if you are in a net positive uh, position uh, and there is a liquidity source present, present and you are you are willing to accept whatever this liquidity source provides as means to settle your debt, then if you are net positive, you can expect to get something uh, from mm -hmm. this liquidity source. So if you get something or if you get everything, depends whether there is enough liquidity. So the minimum required liquid amount of liquidity to clear all debts can be easily measured so we, we call this uh, net internal debt but then in terms of liquidity provision it also has to be distributed uh, according to the distribution of this b vector that i mentioned basically mm -hmm. Uh, to, to simplify, if, if everyone who is uh, net negative, basically has more debts than, than credits, has access to liquidity that is at least as big as the, the negative state, mm -hmm. then the solution to the system is trivial. Basically, everyone right. cl clears everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, the, the use of the system the use of the multilateral oh, obligation yeah. setup is interesting because this situation that everyone has enough access to liquidity is uh, usually not the case. What you achieve with uh, uh, using multilateral offset, uh, obligation offset, instead of going to like, okay, I pay you and then you are actually maximizing the use of available liquidity. Mm -hmm. What you do is you you, you uh, discharge the maximum possible amount of obligations. If you leave this to a chance or to the decisions of every individual player, which is an, a normal state in, in life, like, okay, I have some money in the bank and then I pay and when I get more, I pay more. Mm -hmm. So when you leave this to individual choices, there is no way to get the optimal solution. So. Sure. So that, there's a few really interesting things there. First off is like, I mean, that just sounds like a complete game changer. You know, you've got multilateral obligation set off and that will get you so far. And that's great. But what it also does is it enables you to target these, this liquidity, these means of payment in a very deliberate, conscious way. And that comes back to what we we're saying earlier about communities being empowered to prioritize their economic outcomes. It seems to me that the combination of having the multilateral set off and the knowledge of the economy, the economic network, which enables you to make these decisions is what's going to be really transformative. Yeah, you, you, uh, you your conclusion is up to point. So I, 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 I agree in full. So this is, this is exactly what we are trying uh, to do. So our long-term objective is uh, to provide tools to uh, to everyone who wants to use them to to create uh, a, a, a resilient, uh, well-managed monetary uh, system that is mm -hmm. integrated into into the rest of the monetary environment. So we don't want to build uh, fully isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, systems because nothing is really isolated in life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is maybe a slightly technical question which I've been wondering about for a while. So we've been talking just now about the very strong multiplicative effect of having a means of payment like mutual credit, being able to combine that with the multilateral set-off network. And from what I understand, the estimates of the number of obligations you can clear have come from computational simulations. There are no actual empirical examples of a community combining multilateral set-off with um, a liquidity source 
to clear most of their applications without money. There's no there's no real world example of this having happened yet. Is that correct? Uh, this is this is correct for uh, if if you if you are talking about the communities. Mm, but mm. Uh, actually, this is happening every day mm -hmm. in, inside the financial network. So this idea of uh, doing multilateral obligation set off is actually, uh, this is one of the tools that uh, financial industry calls liquidity saving method. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what people don't uh, really know even most of bankers don't don't know. So only those specialized in, in systemic risk and payment systems are aware of these systems. Is that there is not enough money to to, to do all the transactions mm. uh, uh, in a, a moment in an instance. Mm -hmm. So there are always payment queues. And this payment queue, so the traditional method was, okay, let, let's have a payment queue and let's see what happens. If, if it doesn't go through, you just put the payment order back and mm -hmm. maybe the next time it comes around, uh, the, the, the debtor maybe already got some payment and there is liquidity and it goes through. Mm -hmm. It turns out that this uh, the simple simple methods simply cannot support the complexity of uh, of uh, the, the economy we have developed mm. uh, what what happens is you you get gridlock situations within these networks that mm. are unresolvable by such uh, simple methods so the payment system has to use multilateral relation set of to run and mm -hmm. the most aggressive use of this uh, system is actually happening in the united kingdom Mm -hmm. where this this system so you you have like they they, they do like 10 seconds of uh, queue processing and then 15 seconds of multilateral obligations mm -hmm. off and mm -hmm. so on and without this uh, shifting of of modes uh, uh, the the real time uh, gross settlement system would not work so the uh, what would happen is there would not be enough liquidity to Mm. Go through. Mm. So banks would be forced to issue more more money, and this is not what they really want to do. So the mm -hmm. banks already issued too much money, I think. Yeah, and uh, yeah. issuing even more to uh, to support uh, the payment system is not really an option. So mm. Mm. Uh, so these systems are used all the time, but they are not used to benefit a normal person. And what yep. we are trying to do now is to bring these benefits, which are very obvious and extremely, they, they are life essential. So the, the banking system wouldn't work without this. Mm, mm, mm. So bringing this system and the benefits of this system to, to, to everyone, this is- yep. um, So that there really is plenty of real world experience with, with managing yes. and operating these systems, but it's not something most people are aware of, much less empowered to, to do for themselves. I do, and again, coming back to this multiplier effect, um, as I say, if, if I understand correctly, you've done some computational simulations on what would happen if you have a liquidity source introduced into the kinds of economic networks you have behind you. Um, but I first became aware of your work through the paper you published with Paolo Dini at the start of 2021, which was looking at combining multilateral set off as used in Slovenia with the Sardex mutual credit system. Mm -hmm. And the numbers I have in my head from here, I might be misremembering, was that for a typical participant, they might expect perhaps 25% reduction in their need for money from multilateral set off, and then a further 25% from the use of mutual credit. And the paper indicated, at least as far as I interpreted it, that these were additive. There wasn't a, a kind of synergistic mm -hmm. multiplier effect. Is that, could you, could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, this these numbers uh, were done on on uh, very grounded assumptions. So the mm -hmm. assumption is that uh, people want to uh, do multilateral obligation set off, and the second uh, assumption was that uh, the mutual credit system used is uh, is uh, designed responsibly. Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And uh, from this, this uh, from this experiment restriction, you get this 25% benefit from mutual credit because mm -hmm. uh, we were talking with Paolo how to how to set up the experiment, and uh, we, we we agreed that we should respect the, the reality, uh, not to go for a theoretical maximums or, mm. or things mm. like that. So we we uh, we set up the, the the mutual credit system for the experiment by the same criteria that is used in Sardex, and that is mm. that the maximum credit a firm can get. Uh, does not exceed 10% of annual revenue of this firm. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you would want to, to increase the success of uh, mutual credit in this experiment that we published, you would have to uh, adjust the rules. So uh, if you give firms more than 10% of annual revenue as a, as a maximum credit, mm -hmm then there would be more liquidity and then mm -hmm. you would clear more but i think showing unrealistic uh, results in an, an experiment so we, mm. we 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 tried to be responsible and not yeah. set up uh, expectations too high yeah and and if i understood correctly this was when you say experiment it was almost it was part experimental and part computational and so as you say you had to make these assumptions and you wanted the assumptions to reflect, I guess, a conservative, um, a conservative situation rather than being overly optimistic and getting results which wouldn't reflect likely real-world outcomes. Yeah, yeah. We we use the real-world data, so the transactions mm -hmm. are real, uh, and uh, the conditions uh, to to get mutual credit uh, were also real. So this mm -hmm. is this is not made up. Yeah. Um, the, what, what was basically uh, as, assumed added was this multilateral observation set of which, unfortunately, the the, the management in at Sardex uh, were not supportive of mm. this idea, uh, and I'm I'm still not aware of of, of all the reasons, but maybe. <laughs> The fact that one of the founders decided to to leave the the company tells mm. something about that. Mm. The the support for this kind of thinking, even within the complementary currency um, community, is is not uh, is is not guaranteed. Let's say so. We yeah. have to fight yeah. for this. But I think what's really exciting is we've got this convergence of capacity, um, the ability to do these simulations to gather real world data to deploy these tools in communities which i think means that sooner or later we're going to have something really really compelling which we can point to and say this isn't based on assumptions this isn't based on um, simulations this is something which we've actually done in a real world context and the results hopefully speak for themselves i think we're rapidly approaching a point where that will be true what is it which you're most excited about which is coming next what am I most excited? I'm so the the interest for this is is growing. Uh, my excitement comes that it it is growing everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's not just uh, projects like local looks. Uh, we have a lot of interest, uh, for example, uh, from grassroots economics. Mm -hmm. So the they they have a different uh, system there uh they don't uh, there is no way to get obligations there but uh, what mm -hmm. they do they have uh, they have a multitude of uh, pro producer backed uh, vouchers mm -hmm. and uh, clearing uh, or, or setting off uh, different types of vouchers between themselves is an interesting problem so this mm -hmm. is one of one of the things i'm very excited about and i'm working on, on, on this also then there are different uh, projects uh, in, in Europe. Uh, there is a different environment in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm excited to, to, to work there. So we have colleagues uh, that are actively seeking opportunities. And, uh, but the conditions there are different. So mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting um, situation. And um, 
Okay, maybe I should explain what the, the biggest difference is. So the Europe versus America. So what we have in Europe, we have um, we have a different situation in uh, identifying the participating parties. So in, mm -hmm. in Europe, it's quite normal to put a, a VAT number on on an invoice, and uh, and uh, ide identification of participating partners can be done. Uh, using a st standardized uh, identifiers even across borders. So in the United States, mm. you have zero identifiers. So mm. you can you can write whatever you want on your, on your invoice, and even if you are an invoice aggregator, you, you might have a problem because uh, you, you you don't there is no way to uniquely say who is who. Mm. Mm. This is one one of the uh, very interesting. Uh, problems and then the the other thing is that uh, so they don't have VAT we have it and uh, VAT so this uh, uh, tax authorities get much more involved in, in, in uh, of this obligation creating uh, processes and uh, even more than in Europe you have this in uh, Southern America and Central America so. The world the record holder in, in, in uh, having a tax authorities uh, uh, controlling all the process would be uh, Brazil. Okay. Mexico, Mexico is all, also very heavy. Mm, mm. So, uh, um, so these different local conditions then create the different uh, special requirements uh, yeah. for this system. And, and uh, for me, this is a challenge and part mm. of the excitement. So for mm -hmm. me, this is, mm -hmm. I don't see this as a, as a problem. And I see this as something that, that makes my work more interesting. Right. It would be too easy if you solve the problem once and for all, yeah. you know, for the entire world, that would just be too straightforward and too easy, wouldn't it? You know, and you'd be out of a job and that would be tragic. So yeah, yeah I agree. I it, it, there is so, <laughs> well, okay. there's, there's so much to do. I, I'm not yeah. afraid of, of being bored. Um, yeah, but it always it's it always comes back to implementation, as we were saying at the start. So how how can people um, follow or get involved with your work? Yeah, the the easiest uh, way would be uh, to to go to the cofi.informal.systems uh, webpage. So we we have all the key information there. We also now we started a blog. Mm -hmm. And we, we we are trying to to make this as accessible as possible. And uh, yeah, we will definitely announce when our products are ready to try. So mm -hmm. we are working uh, on, on a way to support communities like Local Loops, basically the the local communities where there is a trusted uh, local. Uh, organization that uh, that uh, is actively involved in, in creating the network mm -hmm. but needs the support the technical support and uh, implementation support so this is one uh, area and the other area we are working on is to to create a specific um, multilateral obligation set of chain mm -hmm. which is then aimed to to more crypto uh, uh, for those who are not afraid of, of, of the concept of crypto so I, crypto mm. is uh, so there is a lot of bad bad events in the in the past but this is mostly connected with uh, with this idea that there is a crypto coin that can save the world and all mm. this speculative behavior connected with uh, which coin is the one who will be, mm -hmm. be the one and only one so we are not uh, we are not aiming at this part so we see uh, blockchain and crypto as a tool uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to basically notarize the obligations and use these notarized obligations uh, in, in a very transparent and safe way using the mm -hmm. blockchain uh, and, and the cryptographic tools uh, to assure not just that the results are, are correct and trusted, but also private. So this is, mm -hmm. this is another part that we are working on. And I, I'm hopeful we, we will be able to announce something. Soon. 
well, sounds like I'm going to have to interview again, interview you again sooner rather than later. In that case, There's yeah, I hope so, so much going on. Yeah. yeah, well, brilliant. Thank you very much, Tomash. Thank you very much for having me, and um, best of luck for the NCSI and and Local Loops project. Thank you. Speak soon. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.